Well, this morning we're continuing in our Unlikely Legacy series, talking about Ruth. And two weeks ago, Rachel kicked us off teaching about Tamar and how God is sovereign. We're accountable, but God is sovereign over all things. And then Anne taught about Rahab last week, the prostitute who made a, a step of courageous faith and it became part of the lineage of Jesus because of it. And so today we're going to talk about the third woman in our unlikely legacy, and that's Ruth, another foreigner who was grafted into the line of Jesus. And we studied Ruth last year. And if you were here, then you, you've been deep in this story. And I want to encourage you, if you weren't here last year, Today we're going to kind of take a bird's eye view of Ruth. We're going to talk more about her character, not as much about the story itself. But I want to encourage you to go back and listen to those talks from last year. I want to encourage you to read Ruth this week. Because we all get overwhelmed with life, right? Have you, have you been there? The days where it feels like everything is is going wrong, nothing is going right. Maybe feeling like in order to move forward and make a decision, you've got to make sure that all the plan all the way to the end is in place before you take that first step. Maybe you feel that pressure to have everything worked out in your life. But we all know that that doesn't really happen right? Because we can't see into the future. We don't have a crystal ball. We are learning more and more that we don't have control over all of these things. It's not often that we can know the end of the story. We really just have to take the next step. And God tells us that in his word, right? Because he tells us that his word will be a lamp unto our feet. Now, I know you know, some of that comes from back in the Old Testament and when the Bible was written, they didn't have big stadium lights, right? They had to do something during the day or they had to function by a candle. But I think there's a lot of truth to the fact that God's word, even if they had stadium lights, even if God could shine stadium lights and show us our whole entire life, there's a lot of truth to God gives us a lamp and he shows us just the next step. And so when we want to have things planned out, when we want to know how the story is going to end, he requires us to lean on him, to trust him, and to just take a next step of obedience and faith. But I love this quote from Corey Ten Boom, and I think that it is appropriate for the story of Ruth. It says this, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And what I want you to hear and what I want you to remember today from this story and in your own life is don't underestimate what God can do with just one yes from you. Don't underestimate what he's going to do when you take that one step of obedience towards him. So many times we get stuck thinking too far down the road when really all we need to do is say yes and take one step. And God takes that and he multiplies it and he does more than we could ask or imagine. So again, I really wanna encourage you to read the book of Ruth this week. It's short, it's just four chapters. Unless you, have, unless you have a study Bible where it's all spread out, it's really about three pages. You can do it. You can listen to it if you want to. <clears throat> but go back and listen or read the story of Ruth this week. But let me give you a quick overview. Um, and also, real quickly, if you want to go back to the study that we did last year, you can go to our website, you can go to our YouTube channel, our podcast. And those teachings from last year are there if you want to dive deeper into the story. But for the story of Ruth, we start in the time of the judges. Do you remember us talking in a Bible overview about the time of the judges? This was when people were doing what was right in their own eyes, 
And when we do that, we, we do what's right in our own eyes, and then we come over here and we get ourselves in a bind, and we say, uh, okay, now I'll ask for help. And so they would cry out to God for help. He would save them. He would bring them back and restore them. They would live honoring and obeying him for a little while, and then they would do their own thing again. And they would repeat that cycle over and over. And so that is the time period that the story of Ruth is set in. And so we start in Bethlehem. That's going to be important, okay? We start in Bethlehem with a family of four, a husband and a wife and their two sons. And there's a famine in the land. And they hear that there is food across the river in Moab. And I want to show you this map of where they went. You can see Bethlehem on the left there, and they headed all the way around and down to the land of Moab. Now, that's a pretty far way when you think about you're having to walk, right, or ride a donkey. I'm not sure which is worse, walking or riding a donkey, but it's a pretty good haul. And so when they get to Moab, the father dies. And so we're left with a, a mother and her two sons, and her two sons marry. Now, this was significant because they married foreigners. God had said, don't do that, but they did. They married these Moabite women. And then both of the sons die. We don't know why. A lot happens in the first few verses. But now, here's where we are. We've got the mother left, Naomi. We've got the two daughter-in-laws left, one of whom is Ruth. Now, Naomi is grieving because she's lost her husband and her sons, but she hears that there is food again back in Bethlehem. And so she comes to her two daughters-in-law and she says, I'm going back to Bethlehem. There's food there. That's my home. There's nothing left for me here. I'm grieving. God has forgotten me. It's basically how she feels. And she says, I'm going back to Bethlehem. And they start off and the daughter-in-laws are coming with her. And she says, wait a minute, <laughs> don't come with me. You're already a widow but if you are a widow and you go to a foreign land, it's going to be nearly impossible for you there. So stay here. Go back to your families. I hold nothing against you for that. I want you to do that. And so she tries to send her daughter-in-laws away. And one of them says, okay, I'm going home. And Ruth, the other one, she says, no, I'm going with you. And so we're talking today about saying yes to God. And in our story, we have two big yeses that we're going to talk about, two big steps of faith. And this is the first one. Ruth has lived with Naomi. She has come to believe in this God that Naomi believes in. And it's quite a credit to Naomi because she's lived in this foreign land. She's lost her entire family. And yet she has instilled this faith. She has modeled this faith to Ruth. To the point where in chapter 1, verse 16 of Ruth, Ruth says this to Naomi. She says, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. For where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. So Ruth has no idea what's coming. She has no idea how this story is going to play out. She has no idea what awaits her in a foreign land. But she knows two things. She knows Naomi. She loves Naomi. She's loyal to Naomi. And she loves the God that Naomi serves. And so she makes this single decision that completely changes her life. So Ruth and Naomi return to Bethlehem, but with a very bleak future ahead of them. Because we know that in these times, this was a patriarchal society, right? Women had, had a very diminished role. They needed a man to protect and provide for them. That's the way the culture worked at the time. And so when they return, <clears throat> I love the way the text 
the text says some of these things. It, it, it never mentions God by name. But it has multiple phrases in there where it will say things like, it just so happened. And so it just so happens that they cross paths with a man named Boaz. Now, Boaz is the type of guy that everyone loves and respects, and we're going to come back to him. But it just so happens that Boaz is related to Naomi's former husband. And in these times, there was a cultural custom called a kinsman redeemer. And what that meant is if a, a woman is married to a man and that man dies, his closest relative had the responsibility to marry that woman and continue the family. That's the way that the land was held on to. That's the way all the possessions were held on to. That's the way the family line was perpetuated. And so through a series of events and following all of these cultural customs, Boaz becomes a kinsman redeemer to Ruth. And we see the second yes in our story because Ruth comes to him and says, you are our kinsman redeemer. Would you redeem us? Would you redeem me and therefore Naomi and her family? And in chapter 3, verse 11, he says, I will do all that you ask. And he goes on to say, I will redeem you. And eventually Ruth and Boaz get married. And it brings our story full circle. We'll come back to some of those details. So we have these two characters in our story. And we know, because we're in this series, that they are in the lineage of Christ. But Ruth was unlikely. Why was she unlikely? First of all, she was a foreigner. She wasn't from the Israelites. She wasn't from God's people. She was outside of that. She was a foreigner from Moab. Second of all, she was a widow. We don't usually see things ending well for widows in this time period. Boaz was unlikely as well. Because if you go back to last week, and teaching us about Rahab, Rahab was Boaz's mother. Rahab the prostitute was the mother of this man who, who scripture calls worthy, who was a good man, who loved God. And so we begin to see this spiritual heritage that was being passed down from people who were not in God's family but were grafted in. And God used Boaz even though he was unlikely. God used Ruth, even though she was unlikely. And maybe you feel like you are unlikely to be used by God. Maybe you don't see how he could use you because of the things that you've done in your past or the things that you haven't done. But the good news is God uses people that we don't expect. Now, Rachel, Rachel read you this quote when she opened our series, but I want to read it to you again. It's from Christine Kane. It's going to be up on the screen, and it says, The biblical model is that God deliberately chooses imperfect vessels. Those who have been wounded, those with physical or emotional limitations. And then he prepares them to serve, and he sends them out with their weaknesses still evident so that his strength can be made perfect in weakness. Man, I hope that's encouraging to you. He sends them out with their weaknesses still evident. We don't have to get to a place of perfection. We don't have to get to a place of knowing enough and doing enough right things and living a certain way and following God in a certain way before we can serve him, before we can represent him, before we can be a witness of him. He sends us out with our weakness still evident so that his strength can be made perfect in our weakness. Now, spiritually, we all begin like Ruth, right? Unless you are from a Jewish family and your ancestry goes back and you are from God's chosen people, the Israelites, we all start as foreigners who are cut off from God's family. But through Christ's redemption, 
we are brought into his lineage as adopted sons and daughters. And so we know that Ruth and Boaz were not perfect people, that they had weaknesses, but we see that they said yes to God. One yes. Ruth said, no, I'm going with you wherever you go, wherever your God takes us. That's where I want to be. Boaz says, yes, I'm going to step up and I'm going to redeem you. But saying yes isn't an easy answer, is it? And this answer required three things of Ruth and of Boaz. Required knowing, believing, and trusting in God and his character. They had to know and believe and trust that God was sovereign, that he was capable, that he loved them, that he wanted their good, that he would use them for his glory. And so if we want to be able to say yes to God, if we want to be able to make these single steps of obedience, then we also have to know, believe, and trust him. So my first question today is, what do you know about who God is? What do you know about him? What do you know about his character? Do you look for that? That's why we ask the question over and over in our small groups, what does this show you about God? What does this teach you about his character and who he is and what he's like? That's why I encourage you to to find lists of God's character, of his names in the Bible, things that you can keep before you so you can begin to look for those things in your own life. We have to look back at what God's done in our lives and see where he's shown himself. Because a lot of times we miss it in real time and it's not until we stop and we turn around and reflect and we say, oh, wow, I saw God's hand here and here and here. I told you that I had to be out last week and originally when we set our teaching schedule for this series, I was supposed to teach last week. And Ann was going to teach Ruth this week. And a few weeks after we set the schedule, she came to me and she said, man, I've really been reading a lot about Rahab. And I'm like, well, wait, because you have Ruth. And she said, I know, I know, but I'm really excited about Rahab. Do you think we could switch? And I was kind of like, well, I mean, I was kind of excited about Rahab myself, but um, (laughs) sure, we can switch. And so at the time, I didn't realize it, but that was God's provision because I could not have been here last week. And so we have to look back to see God's care for us, his provision for us, but we have to know what we're looking for. So it's important that you know God's character. It's important that you know what the Bible says about him, not what our culture says, not what other people say. But you have to know what God's word says about who he is. We have to teach our kids about God's character so that they can look for it in their own lives. And so we have to know who God is, but that isn't enough. We also have to believe. So my second question to you today is, what do you believe about God? and who he is, because knowing does not equal believing, right? Believing begins to change our actions. If I go skydiving, I can do a lot of research on parachutes, and I can know that that, I can know in my head that that parachute is going to float me safely to the ground. But if I don't believe that it is going to, I'm not setting foot on the plane and going up in the air right? I think I've told you before, I, like, my greatest fear is snakes. Now, I have a husband and a son who think that they're awesome, and they can catch a little garter snake in the yard that I know in my head is harmless, but I don't believe it. And so when he says, the next one that we're catching, we're going to keep, that's when I say, not, not until something happens to me and you have another wife. 
So believing begins to change our actions. And some of us don't, we, we may know what the Bible says about God, but we don't believe. We don't believe that God's character is good. And maybe that's a product of your circumstances. Maybe that's a product of the things that you have been through where you begin to believe that God's forgotten you, like Naomi. You begin to believe that he doesn't really care what you're going through, that he doesn't see you, that he doesn't know about the details of your life. And so some of us haven't lost our faith, our knowing about God, but we've lost our hope in what we believe about God. But believing is not enough either because the Bible tells us in James 2, 19 that even the demons believe in God. So while believing begins to change our actions, there's a third and final step. We have to trust in who God is. And trust is what really moves us to action. If I know that that parachute is gonna work and I believe it's gonna work, then I step on the plane but I'm not jumping out the door until I trust that it's gonna work. And so we can't trust in something that we don't know. We can't trust in something that we don't believe. It takes all three of those things to move us to action. So where's God asking you to say yes? Where do you feel him calling you to take that one step of obedience that's scary it's scary not knowing how things are going to turn out right it's scary trusting him and giving up control it's scary sometimes to think about what he might take us through for his glory and for our good because there are things that we would never choose that he chooses for us But I wanna remind you of 2 Timothy 1.7 that tells us that God did not give us a spirit of fear. He calls us to trust him, to trust that he sees a big picture of our lives and we only see a little speck at a time. And that little speck doesn't always make sense to us, but it does to him. He has a plan for you. And so where is he asking you to know him more? Where is he asking you to believe in what he says? Even when your head is saying, no, 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 no. Don't go up in that plane. Where's he asking you to trust him, to trust that his plans for you are good? And what's keeping you from doing that? I think these three things are really helpful because it helps you figure out where do I need to focus? Do I need to focus on knowing God better, knowing who he is and what his word says about him? Do I need to focus on believing? Maybe I've gotten off track in what I'm believing about God. Or do I need to just ask him to give me more trust in him? Trust that I can believe what he says, that I can believe who he is, and then I can take that and move into action. Ruth said yes to God, and she returned with Naomi to Bethlehem, where they would find Boaz, their redeemer. But I don't want you to miss the foreshadowing in this story, that they went back to Bethlehem and found a redeemer, and ultimately our redeemer, the redeemer of the entire world, would be born in the city of Bethlehem. And Boaz said yes. And the result is that Boaz and Ruth got married and they had a son named Obed. And Obed had a son named Jesse. And Jesse had a son named David. A man after God's own heart. And we're gonna learn more about David next week. But if you look on down the family line, 
about a thousand years then you find Jesus and so you find these women who were foreigners but they believed in God they took a courageous step to say yes to him and God grafted them in to his family and the lineage of Jesus we're never so far gone that God cannot use us don't get tricked into believing that lie we're never so far gone that God cannot use us because it's not about us it's about him remember it's about his strength in our weaknesses all he needs from us is a single yes let's pray close this morning God I just thank you for who you are would you just teach us more about your character God, would you open our eyes to the things that you're doing in our lives? Would you make us aware of who you are and how that plays out in our day-to-day lives? God, don't let us be like the Israelites who do their own thing until they get in trouble and and they, they get stuck with no way out, and then they call on you. God, let us follow you and use that lamp of your word to light just the next step. God, would you help us to believe who you are? Would you help us to trust who you are in a way that moves us to action, that moves us to say yes in obedience to you, even when we don't know how the rest of the story is gonna play out. God, we love you and praise you. And just thank you for using us, for loving us. In Jesus' name.